Welcome to Dolphin Dragon Radio. I'm your host, ML Ruzchak. I'm here with author David Doyle, and our show today is brought to you by Guardian Looks, the best in unique sunglasses. Welcome, David. Thank you for having me. Now, we were talking a little bit before the show and how you got to be an author. So can you enlighten our listeners a little bit? Yeah, sure. So I um, had a bit of a personal journey there. I was working in the banking sector for a bit over 10 years, about 10 years, uh, 12 years, and uh, found myself at the wrong end of a workplace incident, accident, and um, ended up being medically retired. And during that time, I spent a lot of uh, extra time with, with my grandfather, my last re re uh, remaining uh, grandfather, and uh, started to, we, st we both started talking and sharing um, uh, uh, things about what, what, what kind of traumas we've been through. And um, that's when he started opening up about um, his, his personal story of uh, uh, being a 14 year old partisan fighting in uh, fighting the Germans and then being taken to Dachau concentration camp. Um, so ended up being quite inspired by um, all this um, history and from what all this, uh, this comeback story, if, if you were, um, and uh, uh, we I, we both decided that we had to write, we had to put it all down pen to paper. It was just too good of a story not not to tell. It is I, anything that comes from World War II, do, regardless of what side you're on, it's we need to teach it. We need to go in there and we need to teach it to the younger generation. If we have a whole series here in the U.S. and you're down in Australia, correct? Mm. Yep. That don't even believe the Holocaust existed. And that's a pity because there's so much evidence, so much trauma there. Mm. And to say that it didn't happen, we need to teach people, yes, it did. And we need to take the steps to make sure it doesn't happen again. Exactly. And when you study World War II in particular, and the, what ran up to the 1930s and 1920s, that there was some glaring and very disturbing similarities between then and now mm -hmm. you know we've got the financial a bit of a financial crisis at the moment um we've got a pandemic which would equate to um uh, food shortages they had in the in 30s and all these far left and far right movements start cropping up um yeah it, it, it history really is a window into the future it is if we don't teach it if we yeah. don't heed the warnings of the past we are bound yeah. to repeat it and it's so mm. glaring right now if you work look at any country the similarities are glaring at us if you look at the u.s the similarities with the poorly being so polarized with the left and right it's scary yeah 100 percent agree yeah it, and it just makes for a nervous environment for everyone but the good news is that we know to how how to overcome it because we've done it before. As, again, <laughs> as long as we as, as as long as we pay attention to what how how we do it and from how we did it before. Yeah, we don't want to let it get to the extreme of World War II. Yeah, precisely. We yeah. want to stop it long before that. But I'm so glad you were able to put the book into paper. Now, when you're doing it, because I don't have a book in front of me. So, <laughs> yep. did you do it from a fictional point or non-fictional point? At, uh, at present, I've got it as non-fiction. Um, so I was able to get basically everything I needed from him, and what I didn't have, I was able to get from research. Um, and the book itself now is it at the editing stage, so it's nearly ready to come out. Um, oh, wonderful. Yeah, no, it should be um, shouldn't be too long, I imagine, and and. Uh, sorry, I just lost, I lost my, my train of thought there for a sec. Is it shouldn't uh, be too long. So are you doing yeah. it as a self-published or indie author, or are you doing it through a traditional publishing house? Um, now, I actually started looking through the traditional route, but um, my grandfather started to become rapidly ill. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so I decided in order to um, uh, sort of ease a bit of his, uh, I know he was worried about whether or not we'll get published. So I went down the self-publishing, I mean, this indie route, um, independent method through um, Ex Libris. Um, and uh, the, the smile on his face um, when he knew that it was going to be, it will be printed and published, it will be sold, there will be copies. Um, he, he won't, his story won't be forgotten. Uh, I remember that quite fondly, and it's, um, yeah, it made it. It so made his day. It made his day. So for me, it was worth worth speeding up the process. And um, but so far, I've really enjoyed the indie route. Um, I've had a lot of flexibility with the the time um, and um, sort of experimenting with and not having so much of it. Uh, uh, rules or, or boundaries, you know, the, it's sort of a bit more, there's a few more options perhaps if you go down the independent route. Right. And, and it varies country to country too, which way is more flexible or how you work. And there's a, everyone yeah. thinks, oh, the indie route in every country is the same. No, no, honey, yeah. it's not. <laughs> yeah. Totally agree. I mean, you can go, if I talk to someone in uh, France or Italy, the indie route is completely different from Australia to India. Yeah. So yeah. I learn as I talk to authors across the pond. Oh, thank you. Yeah. No, it's it, as, as a wise man once said, always listen. You've got two ears and one mouth, you know, use it proportionally. <laughs> <laughs> well, we try. So yeah. we, we have this book out which is named what okay so it's named fortitude a life enduring and at the moment um the website is just having its finishing touches but there is a facebook uh, account if you search fortitude um a or forest roost fortitude you, you it'll it should pop up awesome. and um so at the moment i'm using facebook as the, the main platform I, I must admit i'm still learning twitter uh and instagram okay I will tell you, I have a bigger following on Facebook, but I'm mm. on Instagram more and it's more user friendly yeah. for promoting books. Facebook mm. does not like you to promote books under the new guidelines. Oh, um, of course. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So as yeah. a publisher, I'm like always fighting with Facebook because the post doesn't com- meet community standards. Yeah. I'm hosting a book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So just so you know, to teach you, because this is your first book, uh, Instagram is a lot easier to promote your work. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to dive, diving right into Instagram. I've, I've got an account set up, but um, it's, um, I'm still getting the hang of, of using it. Okay, I, I made the account yeah. back in 2016. I just learned Instagram last year. Yeah, that's yeah, that's how I feel. <laughs> so, it, don't worry online. about it. it. It's it's there, but with promoting, and I, this is for all authors that are listening. Promoting mm. your book is a lot better in Instagram and Twitter than it is Facebook, just because of the way their community standards are currently at. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So we have four to two coming out yep. soon, soon for Grandpa. Are yep. you thinking about writing another book after that? Yeah, I've had a few ideas. Um, the more I study the region and um, how how sort of it, it's very unknown, its history is unknown to um, to anyone outside of the Balkans region. So I've had a few ideas. I've put them in um, an idea in an ideas box, mm-hmm. put, left it to one side and, until I finish this project. Because I know that if I look at two, I'll, I'll try and work on two. <laughs> um, but okay. yes, I, I, I intend to write more. Good. I mean, okay, here's something you're going to learn as an author. Mm. Most author have two to three works in progress or WIPs at any yep. given time. Because yep. it helps with writer's block if you work on different projects. Yeah, that would make sense. That would have helped actually. 
one, once or twice. <laughs> Can you tell I mentor authors? This is what I do. It's not just talking to authors, it's mentoring as well. Thank you. No, loving every moment. So, okay, so we have a couple books that might be coming out probably late 2022, 2023. <laughs> yep. Yep. And I say that because it takes usually about a year to write a book. Yeah. More so if it's nonfiction because you have a lot of research that needs to go into it. Yeah. Or historical based fiction has the same amount of research. Yeah, exactly. So, so yeah, in well, your spare time, what are you working <laughs> on? Um, I'm working on being the best dad I can be. <laughs> I just want to spend as much time as I can with the kids and the family. And this, this, this project, this book certainly takes up a good chunk of my time. And um, sometimes I, uh, I don't share it appropriately. <laughs> the kids need, it, so need a bit more, more attention. But the kids uh -huh. later on, when they get older, will thank you for writing Grandpa's story. Yes, agreed. Um, I remember it somewhat myself as a, as a kid, you know, having one parent go through university while uh, working and, um, and then the other parent doing the exact same thing when the first one finished. Mm -hmm. So I, I, know, I know what it feels like to, to get the, look, not right now, not right now. Daddy's working. <laughs> but I still feel awful. Yeah, it, it's something we as parents have to go through. We work from home. So the kids see us home all the time. Mm. Well, just because we're home doesn't mean we're not working. So we have to balance constant minute by minute, every 10 minutes sometimes between being parent and being whatever we're working on. Yep. Yep. Agreed. I mean, I went through a medical thing in 2011. So in 2016, when I started writing, my daughter's like, mommy, you're always on the computer. She was like, I don't know, I forget, uh, 10 at the time. So yeah. it's, it's what you yeah. can do. Exactly. What, what, what do you do? Mm -hmm. mine, are, mine are eight years and five years old. So the one that's eight years, he, he's good. He, he knows my limits and he remembers the accident. I, I was in a big car accident. Truck cleared me up from behind. He was on his phone oh. um, and broke my back. Um, had major surgery to get over that and it took a long time to get over the surgery. Um, but yeah, now I can't even pick her up. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm slowly getting there, and, but she doesn't understand. <laughs> you know, yeah. she's a, she's a five-year-old. She wants to be picked up and tossed in the air like, like granddad can or her uncles can. Right. They don't, yeah, so. they don't understand when they're little mommy or daddy can't do x y and z and they don't yeah. understand why mommy and daddy can't do this but uncle here or auntie here can yeah exactly and that's i think what's going to be inspiring one of my ideas for my next for my next book will be a bit of a my experience is going through um going through trauma how i dealt with it that will be a wonderful story. So it's inspirational when you can inspire someone to overcome something that you already overcame. Mm. It's inspiring. It helps people. It puts good into the world and we need that. Yeah. Oh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Especially right now. Yes, we need more good, positive things happening. We need to be kind to one another as people as human beings instead of what we're seeing in the world right now yeah we're, we're, we're humans first let's mm -hmm. let's be let, let's be gentle and yeah yeah if we can take away the social staminas take away the social profiles take away titles take away and just be humans for a little bit not saying forever just be humans and be kind to one another yep then we can start fixing things. Yeah, 100%. Totally agree. I mean, we see this every time there's a tragedy. Unfortunately, we come together for five minutes or 
a month and then we fall apart again. Yeah. We need to put more positive and quit listening to the negative. Yeah, 100%. So books that really inspire because we came, overcame a medical issue or an accident or whatever it is, those are the books that are needing to be read, to be heard, to be seen. Yeah, and I'm looking forward. In one, in one way, I'm looking forward to that journey. Another way, I'm, look, I'm, I'm regretting, or not regretting, but feeling um, cautious about, you know, looking back too deep into the past again mm-hmm. when you spent so much time trying to get out of it. So it's, um, it's, it's, it, it's, it, it's a totally different journey to then write, write what, what you did. Yeah. Well, yeah. you can always take from a fictional point of view. True. If it, if it gets too much, because I'm doing this with my own personal biography, I'm doing it from a fictional point of view from my grandfather's eyes mm. and write it from his point of view using his journals filling yep. in some of my own things and then put a little bit of fantasy in there because my grandfather passed away in 1999. Yeah. So he, he's going to be telling the story as a spirit. Yes. So yes. It, it lightens the emotional attachment to some of these things. Yeah. I, I actually have um, wanted to um, leave a copy of the book by his, by his graveside, you know, when it when it when it comes out i think that's when i'll really really breathe a big sigh of relief when i've done that you might be able to get it published quickly as an indie author and then later on transferred over to a traditional publisher for a wider yes uh, that that's the plan yeah um yeah historical nonfiction is a big turn on for most publishers Mm. so but it just takes a really long six months to nine months to just to get it published yes exactly yeah so if you start with the indie route get a couple copy for your friends and families yep and then go to the traditional publishers hey i have a track record yeah it might be easier you're reading my mind (laughs) That's, Isn't that funny? Yeah, great, great minds think alike. <laughs> we do. Yes, absolutely. So let's see. What is one thing that you learned doing your grandfather's story? Oh, um, I, I suppose I didn't really know how damaged he was as a as a person um mentally scarred as a person um until he spoke because these stories are stories that he's kept for 50 no 70 70 70, yeah 70 years um he hasn't told my my mother or my uncle my aunt um these were all the first time coming out um and um we really bonded over that because um, we both have PTSD for different reasons. He was undiagnosed. He was told, you know, to suck it up, you know, suck it up, uh, you know, have a beer, knock it out of your system. And um, it explained so much about him. And I just cried because I, I, I completely misjudged him for, for decades. Mm-hmm um so you just it really goes to show you just never know who's suffering what you know? mm-hmm. um yeah and that's how, that's how we became so close yeah see my my dad my stepdad was in the korea war conflict oh uh, yep he never talked about it until we took him down a few years ago on family vacation and at mm. the time i was married to a former a military person and yep. he started opening up because you get two military people together yeah and they talk yeah. i growing up never knew he was in a conflict uh, he already sa- always said oh i never left the state i only went to uh fort Knox, and that was it well when we got him on vacation he started talking 
there's so much more history there. And then it wasn't until here recently, I got a copy of his service record and got all of his medals and his ribbons and things that he earned that yeah. the originals were um, destroyed in fire. So I replaced them for him. Unfortunately, That's... he didn't get to see the finished product before he passed. I'm sorry to hear that. I was, I, I had a similar story um, with the medals, but I was able to, um, I was able, because Yugoslavia no longer exists, you can't get medals. Mm -hmm. But uh, thankfully, the uh, the the World War Two uh, after uh, market is quite healthy. So there's, I was able to get him the te the correct medals that he won. And um, I gave it to him on his 90th birthday. Aww. And um, um, I, I've never seen him cry. That was the first time I saw him cry. Um, I, I think it just over, overwhelmed him. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, he <laughs> overwhelmed me. <laughs> uh, that was a good day. That was a good day. Yeah. It, when I told my dad I was getting them, it was a relief for him because he hasn't seen them since 1970 something. Oh, wow. And yeah. And to yeah. be able to, to know that one of his children has them yep. or has them replaced. Yeah. It was is a sigh of relief for them. If you haven't yeah. been in the military, if you don't have family members that are in the military, you don't understand this. But to have something so precious as a two inch ribbon that's only this big, you know, to have that connection to something they did is emotional. 100%. Yeah. And um, it was interesting doing some of this research, um, talking to the camp directors at um, Dakel Memorial Camp. Um, they actually thought he died um so and last year was the 75th anniversary of liberation so we got an invitation on behalf of the uh german government to go uh go from here in australia over to um dachau um by munich and to participate in the in the um the ceremony unfortunately covid beat us to it of course but um I know he was, he had, the day I told him that he, he doubled his, you know, his uh, physio and exercise classes, you know, he oh, wanted yeah. to be, he, he, he was, he was sucked. He really, really wanted to go to that. If a veteran doesn't matter what country, doesn't matter what side they fought on or anything. If a veteran has an important event coming up, they will get into shape to be at that event. It doesn't yes. matter what it is, they yep. will find a way to get into shape to be at that event. Yeah, yeah. I just wish I could have taken them. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, COVID did a lot of things that shut everything down. And it, it's just, yes, we need to shut things down to keep people safe. We get it. We're not yeah. disputing that. But at the same time, when you have major events, like the liberation, it's important to somehow incorporate that still, even if it's a virtual, yeah. you know, get everyone on a webcam. Yeah, well, they tried rescheduling it for this year, but um, they're waiting to see how COVID goes um, again. So we'll see. If, if it goes ahead, I might be able to sneak over if, if my wife approves. Um, <laughs> uh, but... Otherwise, um, I enjoy look, look, uh, watching it remotely. Yeah. Either way. I, yeah, it, it's going to somehow, some way special because your family's so connected to that event. Well, the archivist was saying they were really excited because he was one of the last living known survivors of Dachau proper, the actual. So Dachau had 52 sub camps. Mm -hmm. um, and he was one. One of the last ones or the last living person from the actual main camp so they're looking forward to actually meeting him yeah i'm so 
here's a little history lesson. Germans have been trying to meet survivors for years, mm. especially, you know, to apologize. They are the most apologetic and they are the most outspoken to keep this from happening again. Exactly. I, I really like the German, German people and I really respect them now um, and appreciate how complex of the emotions they must feel, especially if they w had people involved in the Schutzschlaf or, you know, the SS or the SA and mm -hmm. all these other, or what, just whatever it yeah. was. The, their collective guilt is, um, is, is very touching. And if we listen to the German people today, to stop this from happening in the future. Yes. That that would be a blessing. Oh, yes, 100%. <laughs> we, we have to pray on that one. Yes. I, we have to listen to people who lived through it. We have to listen to countries that are saying, don't do this. <laughs> <laughs> don't le learn from our mistakes. Please don't repeat them. Yeah, exactly. So it's, yeah, they've done a few documentaries on, on that phenomena as well. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's fascinating. I mean, there's a whole history channel here in the U.S. I don't know if it goes to uh, Australia yeah. or not. Yeah, we get it. You get it? Um, yeah. But um, that does World War II history from beginning to end. It takes like two months to get through everything that they categorize. But Wow. That's that that it, that that's making my ears prick up. <laughs> I love I love that sort of content. Well, I I went through a World War II history buff uh, time period in my life, and to mm -hmm. watch everything because I think there's about six different shows on the History Channel that are dedicated to World War II, from yep. the Nazi point of view or the SS point of view to the yep. American point of view to the ally to the access points of view. So you yep. get all of it. It's not just one point of view. Yeah. And it takes you about two months, about eight hours a day to go mm. through all of it. Yeah, exactly. But we're almost out of time. So one more time, how can our listeners and our viewers find you? Okay, find me on Facebook at uh, Boris Roos Fortitude. Um, that's uh, B O R I S R U S Fortitude, and you'll find us on Facebook, and soon, soon, and soon to be on the web uh, on the interweb. Interwebs. Well, if you find you on Facebook and you follow, yes, the link it'll take you to the website. Mm -hmm. That's always the thing. Follow the author on social media because then you get inside to the uh, websites when they come up. Yeah. Or well, you could look, look me up directly under David Doyle author. And I have links in, linking my linking fortitude and myself. We all do that. We link everything back together. And if you yep. get a link tree and you put it in your bio, then you link everything. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Absolutely. But just thank you so much for joining me today. No, thank you. It's been and very for, good. For all of our listeners and our viewers, happy reading. <laughs>